So, um, this is my fourth lecture, but I think I did two parts of my sequence yesterday, so I'm up to part five, which is on the splitting of the normal operator. So basically what I have to do today is, is fill in a couple of major details that I left to the imagination yesterday on uh, how you prove these various theorems about transversality and superrigidity for multiple covers. In particular, I yesterday sort of at least gave you the idea of how you reduce everything to this one theorem called the stratification result, theorem D, which says that you can define a moduli space of multiply covered holomorphic curves that comes in strata of various co-dimensions determined by kernels and co-kernels, uh, dimensions of kernels of, of certain summands in a splitting of the Cauchy-Riemann operator. Right? So if you want to understand what's really going on there, the first thing I have to explain is in more detail what that splitting of the Cauchy-Riemann operator actually is. We looked at one specific case yesterday, which is where this is an operator for a degree two cover, and then it's a relatively straightforward thing because the sections of your normal bundle, you have this Z2 symmetry on everything. And so you can use the Z2 symmetry and split the sections into the symmetric part plus the anti-symmetric part. So that's one specific example, but there's something much more general that you can do here. So to explain this, let's fix a multiply covered curve. I will call the branched cover phi, as usual, and assume it's a d to 1 cover. And there's a simple holomorphic curve v. The composition is denoted by u. And just to simplify my notation, I'm going to abbreviate, because I, I will mostly just be talking about the the normal bundle and the Cauchy-Riemann operator on this normal bundle. So let's abbreviate that bundle by E. That's the normal bundle of the underlying simple curve. And the target of the Cauchy-Riemann operator is then the bundle of complex anti-linear maps from T sigma to that normal bundle. I'm going to call that F. This makes D is my abbreviation for the normal Cauchy-Riemann operator of, of the simple curve V, that's now a map from the sections of E to the sections of F. And is a Cauchy-Riemann type operator. I'm also going to abbreviate phi star D for the normal operator of the cover because that is, in some concrete sense, a, a pullback of this operator D. Okay, and it's operating on the pullback bundle. It sends sections of phi star E to... Now, at this point, I would love to be able to say the target bundle is phi star F, but that's not quite true because phi isn't an honest covering map, but a branched cover. So at branched points, something a little bit complicated happens, and I end up instead with, well, of course, the target bundle for a Cauchy-Riemann operator is always, uh, it's the space of sections of something like Hom bar of T of the domain to that same bundle. I'll just write that here, omega zero one of sigma prime to phi star E. So one of the things I'm going to need to do to really exploit the symmetry of the situation is I want to apply a certain amount of standard covering space theory, um, which means I would like to talk about an honest covering map rather than a branched cover. Now, in some sense, there's an, there's an easy way to do this. I can just remove all the branch points, or remove, in fact, all the critical values of my branched cover, look at the punctured surface, and remove also their pre-images, then I'm looking at an honest covering map between two punctured Riemann surfaces. So let's do that. I'll denote by capital theta the set of critical values of phi in sigma, and theta prime 
will be the pre-image of that set. So in general, remember that's a little bit more than the set of critical points or branch points of phi. It includes also some additional points that happen to map to the same point as some other branch point. Sigma dot will be the punctured surface that I get by removing those critical values from sigma. And I'll denote by sigma dot prime the punctured surface that you get from sigma prime by removing their pre-images, which means now I have an honest covering map phi from sigma dot prime to sigma dot. So it's a covering map of degree d. And then I'm going to want to talk about cauchy riemann operators on this, these same vector bundles, but restricted to the punctured Riemann surfaces. So let's denote d dot is the restriction. of D to the bundle over the punctured surface, which I'll denote by E dot. So there's a technical issue I have to deal with now. Okay, I can say, well, D dot is a linear map from the space of sections of E dot to the space of sections of f dot. Similarly, that's, that's the restriction over the punctured surface. It's a first order linear differential operator, but I need to talk about this thing as a Fredholm operator between suitable Banach spaces. And before I can do that, I need to decide what Banach spaces I'm going to consider for sections on this punctured domain. That's a slightly subtler point, especially if I want it to be a Fredholm operator. So, one of the things that I think about in real life is symplectic field theory, which is that's sort of the adaptation of all this holomorphic curve technology to the kind of setting that Yonko was talking about with symplectic cobordisms between contact manifolds. And you talk about holomorphic curves defined on punctured domains. So in that setting, there are certain Sobolev spaces that are considered natural to use where you often impose an, exp an exponential weight condition in a neighborhood of the punctures. So I'm going to do that here and say if I fix natural number k and p between 1 and infinity and some positive delta, which is also assumed arbitrarily small, then I define the space wkp minus delta of E dot. This is going to be a Banach space of sections of that bundle over the punctured surface. In particular, these sections should be of class WKP loc on E dot. So they're of class Sobolev WKP over every compact subset of the punctured surface. But I need to additionally impose some condition for how they behave in neighborhoods of the punctures. And the simplest condition one would impose is you pick cylindrical coordinates in the neighborhood of each puncture, so you regard each one as a cylindrical end, the sort of thing you see in, in Fleur theories. And as a map from the half cylinder to some vector space after choosing trivialization, require this map to be of class WKP on the half cylinder. Right? And that imposes a decay condition on the map. As you'll see in a moment, a decay condition is not exactly what I want. I want to allow a little bit more freedom than that, so I'm going to modify it slightly. And instead of asking eta on the cylindrical end to be of class WKP, I'll ask for this weighted version, e to the minus delta s times eta is in WKP on the half cylinder. So this is written with respect to holomorphic cylindrical coordinates st 
living in the half cylinder, which you can biholomorphically identify in a natural way with the punctured disk. And just thus choose a holomorphic identification of that punctured disk with a neighborhood of each puncture. So this is near each point of the set of punctures theta. So that's my definition of a, of a weighted Sobolev space. Now, why is this the right space? Let me write down the lemma that tells you at least, well, I don't know if it's the unique good choice for my purposes, but this lemma tells you at least it's going to do what I want it to do, which is I want to be able to look at my cauchy riemann operator d dot on a space like that and make conclusions about the operator I'm actually interested in, which is not d dot, the original d, or its pullback, phi star d. So what's the relationship between those two? There's just a bit of analysis to be done here. And the result is that the operators d from WKP sections of E, now on the non-punctured closed domain, to WK minus 1P sections of F, since it's a first order operator, and its close relative d dot, taking the weighted Sobolev space with this minus delta on the punctured domain to the corresponding weighted Sobolev space of sections of F dot, these two operators have the same Fredholm index. And moreover, they have the same kernel in the sense that the map from kernel of D to kernel of D dot, there's an obvious map from one to the next. You just take a section that's annihilated by D and take its restriction to the punctured domain. It will then also be annihilated by D dot. That's an isomorphism. Okay, and if the kernels are isomorphic, that tells you, and since the indices are the same, then the co-kernels also must have the same dimension. And this is what we really want. We want to be able to say, if one of these operators is surjective, then so is the other one, or similarly injective. Okay, so then all transversality questions about the original operator D can be answered by looking at this punctured version of it. So. Now you can maybe see why this particular exponential weight condition I chose was the right one. Uh, I assume delta to be small, but what does this condition really mean? You have this decaying function that you're multiplying by eta, which means eta itself is actually allowed to have some mild exponential growth at infinity. It need not be bounded, but in particular, it need not decay to zero. If I hadn't included any exponential weight there at all, then eta would be decaying to zero. And this last statement would be manifestly false in that case. In fact, this map would not even be well-defined because the kernel of D contains presumably lots of sections that don't happen to vanish at those punctures. There's nothing special about those punctures when you just look at this operator on the closed surface. Right? If those sections don't vanish there, then restricting to the punctured domain will give you things that are not even in that space unless the exponential weight is included. So I included the exponential weight to make that space just a little bit larger so it can include this extra stuff that's not vanishing at the punctures. Of course, it looks like it might be a lot larger than I want it to be because it contains these unbounded exponentially growing sections. Okay. So there's something to be checked there, and I'll just summarize the main step in the proof, which is to apply some standard asymptotic elliptic regularity results. So it's obvious that the map exists now, and it's obvious that it's injective. It's not obvious that it's surjective. In other words, given some section in that weighted Sobolev space, which is annihilated by this operator, does it have an extension over the closed domain that will be in WKP on the closed domain? And of course, 
it'll automatically also be annihilated by this operator. But does it have the extension at all? So if we have this solution to the equation d dot eta equals 0 that satisfies this Sobolev condition, then by various asymptotic regularity results, there's several papers that I could possibly cite for this, but the, the origin of the whole story is uh, a couple of papers by Hofer, Vysotsky, and Sander in the 1990s. So this story goes away back. Uh, the fact that eta satisfies this linear equation will then tell us that it actually cannot grow too fast at infinity. Its possible growth rates are determined by the spectrum of some self-adjoint operator that's determined by the Cauchy-Riemann operator at infinity, the so-called asymptotic operator, and that spectrum is discrete. So if delta is small enough, then it turns out eta will actually be bounded. And it does have uh, an extension over the punctures of class WKP. So I'm not going to talk about details of this. This, this is what one has to show. So let me just say again what the moral of that lemma is. First, a quick observation. A similar lemma applies, of course, to the pullback operator. Now, the pullback operator on the punctured domain will be a Fredholm operator from WKP minus delta of the pullback bundle phi star e dot to WK minus 1P minus delta of, now I can actually talk about a pullback operator, or sort of pullback bundle, phi star f dot, which is a little bit simpler than what I wrote over here for the unpunctured version. The reason is, I've removed the branch points from the picture. Right? Phi is now an honest covering map that makes this thing actually identifiable with an honest pullback bundle. And now I have a similar relationship between this operator and phi star d that I wrote over there. That's the one I'm really interested in. So, in fact, all transversality questions about phi star d can be answered in terms of the punctured version. I star d dot. Okay, so I'm going to take that as understood from now on and, and not even worry about the, the unpunctured version anymore. We will keep the punctures in the picture, and that way we can talk about honest covering maps with no branch points. All right, so the next piece of this story is I would like to slightly relax the restrictive assumption that I applied yesterday that I'm only talking about so-called normal covers. Right? So <laughs> this goes under the heading of regular presentations, where regular here is, means not Fredholm regular, but in the sense of a regular covering map, which is the same, it's synonymous for normal covering map. So a regular covering map is the kind that has as many aut automorphisms as there are, uh, as whatever is the degree of the cover. So, let's drop that assumption. Let's not assume that the order of the automorphism group of phi is equal to d. In, yeah. Uh, 
I don't know how to do it without that idea. I will say there's a little bit of precedent for this in the literature without that. So there was a paper by Eftikari um, that went on the archive around 2008 and then got seriously revised a few years later and it was finally published, I think, last year. Um, it's proving a partial result towards super rigidity. And he defines his own version of what I'm about to explain with, with this splitting of the cauchy riemann operator, but actually restricting it to the case of regular covers, normal covers. I think if you do that, you can do it his way without actually removing the branch points. Um, it's just, it's, it's a slightly different perspective. But to do it in the level of generality that I want, I think I really have to remove the branch points. I don't see another way. So, we're going to drop this assumption that the automorphism group is as large as possible. It may actually be trivial in general, but what I want to observe is that you can take any covering map of finite degree and relate it to some regular covering map that factors through it. And in fact, there's in some sense a canonical choice for this. So, I'll state it as follows. There exists a regular, in other words, normal, branched cover from some surface sigma double prime, I'll call this cover pi over sigma, whose critical values are the same ones as for phi. So the critical values of pi are again this set theta, such that now if I puncture this regular cover in the same way, so let's take uh, theta double prime to be the pre-image of theta in sigma double prime, and then sigma double prime dot will be the resulting punctured surface that you get by removing those points. Now you have an honest covering map uh, which is regular when you restrict to the punctured surface, and I want to say something about the original covering map, phi. The covering map from sigma dot prime, phi going to sigma dot, can be identified with the following thing. Take sigma dot double prime, take d copies of it, so multiply by a set of d elements, divide this by a certain group action, which I'm going to write as the automorphism group of pi. And map from there to sigma dot by sending the equivalence class of a pair zi to pi of z. So here, There's this finite group G in the picture. G is no longer going to be the automorphism group of my original cover phi, but of this larger regular one, automorphisms of pi. This is acting on sigma double dot, uh, sigma prime, sigma dot double prime, in the obvious way by deck transformations. But it's also acting simultaneously on this set of D elements by some homomorphism. So it's acting transitively on this set of D elements via some injective homomorphism to the symmetric group. I'll denote that homomorphism by rho from G to the symmetric group on D elements. All right. So that's the statement. I can find uh, regular cover. Let's note, I didn't state it explicitly, but you can deduce from the statement the following 
In fact, rho is an injective homomorphism into some finite group, the symmetric group. So that means, of course, G, the automorphism group of my regular cover, is also a finite group. That makes it a cover of finite degree. In fact, you get a bound on its degree from this. Its order, right, the degree is exactly the order of this group, which will be at most d factorial, since that's the order of the symmetric group. So it might be greater than d. It's going to be at least d in every case. It's going to be at most d factorial. So every covering map of this sort can be written in this way. Now, why is it true? The statement might look a little bit familiar if you remember enough basic covering space theory. So there's a version of this that you find in standard textbooks like Hatcher. It doesn't look exactly the same, but it states something very similar in terms of the universal cover of sigma dot. Namely, we can do the following. Let pi tilde from u to sigma dot denote the universal cover. And of course, uh, the automorphism group of the universal cover you can identify with the fundamental group of sigma dot. So pi 1 of sigma dot acts on the universal cover by deck transformations. But there's also a natural homomorphism from pi 1 to the symmetric group in this picture. Namely, pick a base point z0 in sigma dot and pick an ordering of its pre-images in the default cover. So, in other words, just identify in some arbitrary way the set of pre-images through phi of that base point, that's d points, since we're talking about a degree d cover, so we can identify this with the set of numbers from 1 to d. Then there's a, a standard sort of covering space trick you can apply, which is that you take any loop based at z0, lift it to that cover, sigma dot prime, it's not going to be a loop anymore, necessarily. But there's d different ways that you can loop it, uh, lift it to paths that go from one point in phi inverse of the base point to another point in that, that same pre-image. So that defines a permutation of those d points. That associates to every loop, and in fact to every base homotopy class of loops, a particular permutation of d elements so by lifting loops in sigma dot to paths in sigma dot prime we define now a homomorphism rho tilde from pi 1 of sigma dot to this symmetric group on d elements. And having done that, we can now identify the cover phi with the following construction, you take the universal cover, d copies of it, divide it by this action of pi 1 of the base, which is acting on the universal cover by deck transformations, and it's acting on these d elements by the permutations we just discussed. There's a natural map from there to sigma dot that just takes the equivalence class of zi to pi tilde of z. Okay, so one needs to check that there is a natural map between this, diffeomorphism in fact, between this and sigma dot prime 
that identifies the original covering map with this one. And this is all explained in Hatcher. This is a very standard thing. So what I can now do is, well, the universal cover is not such a comfortable object to work with because it's going to be non-compact, guaranteed. Right? It's not even just something you get by taking a compact surface and puncturing it. It's, it doesn't have even a, a nice compactification. And that's partly because this pi 1 of sigma dot here is an infinite group. I'd rather talk about compact surfaces and finite groups. And there's an easy trick for this. I can just now observe that pi tilde descends to a map from, I'm going to define sigma dot double prime as the universal cover divided by the action of a particular subgroup of pi 1, namely the kernel of that homomorphism, rho tilde. So I get a covering map to sigma dot from this, just by descending pi tilde. It's regular by construction. And also, rho tilde descends to an injective homomorphism, rho, from the group G, which is defined now to be pi 1 of sigma dot divided by the kernel of rho tilde. That's now, by construction, injective into the symmetric group, which tells you that that group is finite. And in fact, the automorphism group of the new cover we just constructed is G. So this is all easy to check, and that's the basic construction. It's not especially deep. It's just a convenience. And I'm going to now use it to give you an alternative perspective on the pulled back cauchy riemann operator through this default cover. Let's make a little room. So uh, this, is, this is my non-compact cover. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, this is a cover of infinite degree, because its automorphism group is pi 1 of the punctured surface, which is an infinite group. So I would rather talk about a, a cover of finite degree. And I can do that in just a very simple way by right, this, this cover is determined by the combinatorial data of this homomorphism from pi 1 to the symmetric group. So if I divide by the kernel of that homomorphism, I get a finite group with an injective homomorphism. And that finite group is then the automorphism group of a cover defined on the quotient of this thing by uh, the same subgroup, kernel of rho tilde. So right, then having defined this quotient, I have a covering map. I know what its automorphism group is. And I can see, therefore, that that covering map has finite degree bounded namely by the order of the symmetric group. The only other, I didn't say the, the other part, which is that uh, this thing I constructed, you have to make the observation that since it is a finite cover of a Riemann surface with cylindrical ends, it also is a Riemann surface with cylindrical ends. In other words, you can obtain it from some closed Riemann surface by removing finitely many points. So that's an extra thing one has to check, but it's not hard. By the way, there's also an exercise one can do. It may be that your given cover phi was already regular, and if that's the case, then it turns out that this group G is just isomorphic to the original automorphism group. And in fact, this, this new regular cover pi you've constructed is isomorphic to the original cover. It's just a different perspective on the same thing now. 
But in general, that cover has a larger degree, and, and you, can also, you can also show that it factors through the original cover. All right, so here's what I want to do with this. My covering map is now sort of determined by the combinatorial data of this injective homomorphism rho from uh, some finite group to the symmetric group. Now, if you have a homomorphism of a finite group to the symmetric group, you can build a natural representation out of that. This determines a so-called permutation representation. <laughs> Namely, I'll denote it also by rho, it's a homomorphism to GL dr defined by, so we just have to say what it does to the standard basis vectors, E1 through ED in RD, it permutes them according to this permutation given by rho. So rho of G acts on EI as sending it to the basis vector E rho of G of I. So it permutes the basis vectors. And there's various standard theorems in representation theory about this. So in particular, uh, my original cover is regular, it turns out. Sort of a, a nice way to, uh, to assure yourself that you're doing the right thing. So if the original cover is regular, then you can see that through this algebraic data through the property that this homomorphism will be acting on D elements without fixed points. So not just transitive action, but acting without fixed points. If that's true, this permutation representation here is isomorphic to what's called the regular representation in representation theory, which has several nice properties. For instance, every irreducible representation is then a sub-representation of the regular representation. So. In any case, with or without that, I can always say the following. There's a natural flat real vector bundle, I'll denote by V rho, that I can define as take, so it's going to be a bundle over sigma dot, but I'll take sigma dot double prime, this regular cover, take the trivial RD bundle over that, but now divide it by the natural action of G. That gives me a potentially non-trivial bundle over sigma dot. G is again acting on this regular covering space by deck transformations, and it's acting on RD by that permutation representation over there. So I call it a flat bundle, of course, because as a finite quotient of a trivial vector bundle, there's a, a natural connection on this thing, right? The, the trivial connection descends to a connection on this potentially non-trivial bundle. So I know what it means to say that a section is flat, at least locally. And then I can say this gives us various twisted versions of the original vector bundles E and F. So a denote by E rho, the real tensor product of E dot over the punctured surface with this flat bundle V rho. So it's a real tensor product, but E dot already has a complex structure. So this is also a complex vector bundle in a natural way. Uh, similarly, you can define F rho And it's useful to note that also E rho can naturally be identified with the following thing. If you pull this tensor product back through our regular cover pi, 
you get pi star e dot tensored with, well, pi star of this vector bundle is actually the trivial bundle by this construction here. So we could write this as pi star e dot tensored with the trivial bundle, just write it as rd, but now dividing that by the group action. So I promise you I'll get to the point in a moment. I realize it's not clear yet. What, how do you describe sections of this bundle? This is where it gets interesting. So sections of this twisted bundle E rho are equivalent to, we can say, G equivariant sections of this tensor product here. So a G equivariant sections of the tensor product can always be written as sum, or i goes from 1 to d, of a bunch of sections eta i tensored with these standard basis vectors e i. So that's what a section of pi star e dot tensored with this trivial bundle looks like. But we have to make observation of what equivariance actually means in practice. So equivariance means the sections, there's d of them, eta 1 through eta d, they're all sections of pi star e dot, but they're not arbitrary with respect to each other, they're related. They have to satisfy there's a bit of a computation to be done. The answer is eta i of z always equals eta rho of g of i at g dot z. So this means the action of g by a deck transformation on the domain. And uh, this is, of course, the permutation action on 1 through d. So this is for all z in sigma dot double prime, and g in my automorphism group. So what's the point? That relation has another interpretation. Secretly, what we're actually doing is describing sections of the pullback of e dot through phi, phi star e dot. In other words, there is a canonical isomorphism from the space of sections of this twisted bundle E rho to the space of sections of phi star E dot. That's the bundle we're actually interested in, where our pulled back Cauchy Riemann operator is defined. And the isomorphism just sends this G equivariant section sum of eta i tensor e i to, let's denote it by e hat, where I can define e hat. So it's going to be a function of points in sigma dot prime. Sigma dot prime right now is being identified with, uh, I still have it on uh, the right, that's the full statement. It's identified with this quotient right here. It's the regular cover, d copies of it divided by g. So, eta hat is a function of equivalence classes of pairs z i, where z is in sigma dot double prime, i is from 1 to d, and I need to write down something that will depend only on the equivalence class. This relationship here tells me I can do that just by writing eta i of z. That gives me something well defined. Okay, and it's a bijective correspondence. So, as a matter of fact, this correspondence identifies my pulled back Cauchy Riemann operator phi star d dot with the so called twisted Cauchy Riemann operator. I'll denote by d rho, 
that's going to map sections of the twisted to the twisted f, and it's defined by d rho of eta tensor v equals just d dot eta tensor v for any flat section v. Right, so v rho, that's why I'm using the fact that v rho has a natural connection on it, flat connection. And the fact that I have this flat structure and that bundle means as soon as you have a cauchy riemann type operator on something else that you're tensoring with it, you get a cauchy riemann operator automatically on the twisted version by saying what it does to tensor products with flat sections. So I've now identified the cauchy riemann operator I'm interested in with one that's defined on this tensor product bundle. The advantage of that is that it's very easy to find sub-bundles of that product bundle that are invariant under that cauchy riemann operator. And this is where my splitting actually comes from. So in particular, I could redo this twisted bundle construction starting not from this particular permutation representation, but from any representation of the group G. All right. So, for any representation, theta sending G to the real automorphism group of some vector space W, we can similarly define twisted bundles theta f theta is exactly the same idea just instead of rd here you put in the representation space w with g acting on it by this representation and now there's a twisted cauchy riemann operator d theta sending sections of e theta to sections of f theta such that, in particular, if you break down your permutation representation into sub-representations, rows isomorphic to a direct sum of a bunch of representations, theta 1 through n, then you get a corresponding splitting of bundles. E rho splits into corresponding sub-bundles. And the Cauchy Riemann operator as well splits D rho, splits into a direct sum of twisted Cauchy Riemann operators. So the splitting I stated yesterday comes from this. After you've identified the operator you're interested in with this twisted Cauchy Riemann operator defined in terms of the permutation representation, all you need to know is exactly how is this permutation representation a direct sum of irreducible representations, and what are, what are the multiplicities of each that gives you a corresponding splitting of that operator. All right, so let me state as an exercise, one can actually work out the special case that we talked about yesterday from this more general perspective. So. In the case of degree 2, now the group G is just Z2 again. And our permutation representation is going to be the unique, well, it comes from the unique isomorphism from Z2 to the symmetric group on two elements. So that gives us the permutation representation sending Z2 to GL2R. It acts on R2 by permutations. And of course, you notice that there are two obvious invariant subspaces. Yes. 
R2 splits into the invariant subspace spanned by the vector 1, 1, because all permutations preserve that. And there's also the invariant subspace spanned by the vector 1 minus 1, which is preserved by all permutations, but the non-trivial one changes a sign on that. So this gives you the decomposition of rho into the two representations, theta plus and theta minus that I talked about yesterday, the trivial and the non-trivial irreducible representations. So what one can then check directly is that the correspondence of sections of this twisted bundle with sections of the pullback bundle now identifies the space of sections of each of these sub-bundles, E, theta, plus, minus, with... Now, it's not... They're not spaces of sub-bundles of phi star E dot. They're just subspaces of that space of sections, namely what I called gamma plus minus yesterday, the spaces of symmetric and anti-symmetric sections with respect to the Z2 action. Okay, so this is not so hard to check explicitly. Yeah. Um, what I can say uh, of the, the, the degree of the cover. Right? Yeah. Yeah, what I can say is its degree is at most defactorial because its automorphism group is injecting into the symmetric group. Um, maybe one can say more than that if one is ambitious, but I haven't tried. <laughs> All right, so that was the detailed version of, of the description of this splitting of Cauchy Riemann operators. I should give a reference here, of course. This, this is just a generalization of something that... Actually, I suspect that it's probably considered standard in some circles, but I hadn't heard of it before. Uh, I read this paper by Taubes. That's in JDG, either 95 or 96, I can never remember. It's the Counting Pseudo-Holomorphic Submanifolds paper. This was part of his strategy toward understanding transversality for doubly covered holomorphic tori in defining the Gromov invariant. Um, his case was simpler, of course, because if you're talking about tori covering tori, all of those covers are regular, uh, and the representation theory is easier because the mental group of the torus is abelian. So... Uh, this is somewhat generalized from Taubes' picture. Now, the last part of what I need to talk about is, again, this stratification theorem. I want to at least make an attempt at a proof. So remember, the theorem said that there is for generic J, there's this moduli space of multiple covers satisfying some constraints on the dimensions of kernels and co-kernels of the twisted operators. And the theorem said that that is a submanifold of a very particular co-dimension. So I'm going to reuse some of the ideas that I talked about in proving transversality for simple curves. The sard smale theorem is part of the picture. Uh, there's a universal moduli space, and at the end of it, there will also be a unique continuation lemma, just a different one from before. So, let's start with a universal moduli space. Actually, two universal moduli spaces. So, MDG of KC will be sitting inside MDG. 
The difference from the previous discussion is that I haven't written J in the notation here because I want to consider the union of all those spaces for all Js in some family parameterized by a Banach manifold of almost complex structures. So in particular, MDG now means the space of all pairs J and U, where J belongs to my previous Banach manifold of almost complex structures, and U belongs to the space MDG of J. Right? And the constrained version is defined similarly. It's just the subset of this such that the kernels and co-kernels satisfy the constraints given by these integers, k and c. So, two things to note immediately. Well, one thing. This universal space MDG is a smooth, separable Belknock manifold. It is infinite dimensional because it depends on this parameter j moving around in an infinite dimensional manifold of complex structures. But it's smooth. And I would call this standard in that this almost already follows from what I proved about transversality of simple curves. I defined there a moduli space, a universal moduli space of simple curves. And the main step in that proof was to prove that that universal moduli space is a smooth Banach manifold. This one is almost the same thing. It's just a little bit enhanced. It consists of, so each of these curves u is not just a holomorphic curve, but it's a combination of a simple holomorphic curve with some branched cover of that curve. So that simple curve lives in its own smooth universal moduli space, and the branched cover exists in a finite dimensional smooth family of branched covers over each of those curves. So this is a smooth manifold. Following is what I need to show. I want to show that this universal space with the constraints sitting inside MDG is a smooth on a submanifold Of the right co-dimension, the co-dimension should be the same formula I stated before. Sum over all the representations of the type of the representation times the value of the kernel constraint times the value of the co-kernel constraint. So that was the same formula. If I can show that, the rest is just a sartre smale theorem argument. In other words, this is now a smooth Banach manifold, so you consider the natural projection that sends each of these pairs to just J in the space of almost complex structures. And then uh, generic elements in that space will have the property that the pre-image is a smooth manifold. And it's going to be, in fact, a smooth sub-manifold of the corresponding pre-image of this guy with exactly that same co-dimension. So this is... This is the idea. So we've reduced it to showing this fact. This subspace here is a Bonnock submanifold of this co-dimension. So here's a useful observation. Given an element J naught U naught in that constrained space, a nearby element that doesn't necessarily satisfy the constraint. So let's say a nearby pair J U in M D J belongs to the constrained space. If and only if the kernel of its normal operator D U N has the same dimension as the kernel of D U naught N. Right? In fact, I'm saying I don't have to worry about the splitting of operators here at all. I just have to pay attention to the dimensions of the kernels. If those two guys are the same, then actually a much stronger condition is true. Namely, in the splitting of the Cauchy Riemann operators, each sum end has kernel and co-kernel of the same dimension as the original guy. 
So this is true for a very simple reason, actually. Remember, each of those normal operators splits into this direct sum of a bunch of twisted cauchy riemann operators. In particular, they're all Fred Holm. Some of them are repeated some number of times. So if they're all Fred Holm, There's a basic fact about Fred Holm operators that you may or may not find obvious, but actually we'll see a proof of it in a moment. If you take a Fred Holm operator and you perturb it just a little bit, now the dimension of its kernel can change suddenly, but it can only go down suddenly. It can't go up. Right? So in a neighborhood of that operator, there's actually an upper bound. Whatever the kernel is, at the moment, that dimension is an upper bound for the dimensions of the kernels of all the nearby operators. You can only have sudden jumps down. So the dimensions of kernels can jump down, but not up. So what would it take to start out from this, uh, this pair that satisfies these particular dimensional constraints on all of the operators in the direct sum? And then you move to another operator such that those constraints are no longer satisfied. So for one of those constraints to fail, it means at least one of these operators in the direct sum must have the dimension of its kernel suddenly jumping down. But there's no way that the dimension of another one can jump up to compensate for that. If that kernel jumps down, the dimension of the whole thing will suddenly jump down. There's no other choice. Right? So if that doesn't happen, it means everything is fine, and you're still in the same constrained space. That's the proof. OK. Yeah. Sorry? Well, I'm just looking at a small neighborhood right now. So you can assume it's connected. Yeah. You can assume it's, it's, I mean, so, right. This guy is a Banach manifold. So if you just look at a small neighborhood of one point, it looks like a ball that's connected. So I want to turn that observation into some useful procedure for measuring exactly which nearby points are in the constrained space. Preferably, I want to call them the zero set of some smooth map so I can apply the implicit function theorem. So this pertains to a general question whose answer you might find interesting, just regardless of the rest of this story. And maybe you're already familiar with the finite dimensional version of this. That's kind of standard, but maybe not as well known as it should be. So I will ask, given a Fred Holm operator, t naught from x to y, just a pair of Banach spaces. What is the set of nearby Fred Holm operators t? So t close to t naught, such that the kernel of t has the same dimension as that of t naught. Okay, so if I were in finite dimensions, I would be asking the question, given a matrix with some particular rank, what does the set of all nearby matrices with the same rank look like? The answer is that that's a manifold of a dimension that depends on the rank. And the reason that's true, it's also true in infinite dimensions, 
So the reason is, if I start out by writing x as the direct sum of some closed subspace plus the kernel of t naught, and y is the direct sum of another closed subspace, namely the image of t naught plus a finite dimensional space, which I could ad identify with the co-kernel, say co-kernel of t naught. Well, with respect to these two splittings, I have t, t naught written now in block form as, let's call it a naught zero zero zero, where a naught is an isomorphism. from v to image of t naught. Okay? Obviously, it's rejective since it's only mapping to the image of t naught, and it's injective because I divided out the kernel. So that means if you perturb to a nearby operator, you still have this block decomposition, and that upper diagonal term will still be invertible. Being invertible is an open condition. T can be written as some A, B, C, D, where A mapping from V to image of T naught is also invertible. Therefore, I can define the following smooth map on the space of Fredholm operators. phi of t equals d minus c inverse b, right? So that's well defined because a is invertible. You should take a moment to look at this composition and make sure it is really a map between the same two spaces as d, namely it sends the kernel of t naught to the co-kernel of t naught. Okay, you can define it, but the reason this is interesting is the following exercise. The solution to this exercise is just a, a, basically a clever change of coordinates. You can show that the kernel of t is always isomorphic to the kernel of phi of t. But now phi of t is a, a linear map between two finite dimensional spaces. So, of course, that gives you the upper bound I was talking about on the kernel of t. The kernel of t cannot be larger than the kernel of t naught. Usually it's going to be smaller. It's going to be the same if and only if phi of t actually vanishes. So, the nearby, we can say, dimension of the kernel of t equals the dimension of the kernel of t naught if and only if t is in the zero set of map phi. And that's a smooth map. So this is something where we can apply the implicit function theorem, and that, that gives you that fact I just mentioned in finite dimensions, that the, the space of matrices of a fixed rank is a smooth submanifold of the space of all matrices. So that stratifies the space of matrices. Similarly, the space of all Fredholm operators is stratified into smooth submanifolds that all have, each of them has a finite codimension which you can compute from this picture because they're all zero sets of some smooth map to a finite dimensional vector space that looks like this. Okay. So that's the idea I'm going to use. So that was just sort of a general digression. 
Now, moving back to the discussion of this particular constrained moduli space, what I learned from this is our nearby pair Ju in MDG near J naught U naught is also in the constrained space if and only if phi of j u equals zero for some smooth map phi which is defined on such a, a, a sufficiently small neighborhood so that we make sure that diagonal term is still invertible so it's just on some neighborhood of j naught u naught in MDG. And it sends us to the finite dimensional vector space of homomorphisms from kernel of du naught normal to its co-kernel. OK. That's certainly a true statement, but if there were only that, I would at this point be stuck. And yeah, in reality, I was stuck for about two years at this point. Uh, not sure what to do until I realized slightly more is actually true because in this entire picture, there's this G symmetry. G is acting on everything. And unless you set everything up in a particularly stupid way, actually the image of this map to be in a smaller vector subspace of this thing. It's in the space of all G equivariant homomorphisms from the kernel to the co-kernel. Okay? That just comes naturally out of the situation. So now you can ask, is it conceivable that when you linearize that smooth map, you get a surjective linear operator? And then the implicit function theorem tells you that the space we're trying to prove is a manifold really is one. Let me make an observation now. <laughs> the dimension of that space can be computed using Schur's lemma. Right? Uh, you want to compute the dimension of the, the space of G equivariant maps between two spaces that are being acted upon by G. The answer depends on how each of them decomposes into irreducible representations of G. And I already sort of stated yesterday the main thing you need to know about that. So each of these kernels has a splitting into the kernels of the corresponding twisted operators, and on each one of those, G preserves that sum end and acts on it by a particular representation. So then you need to do some dimension counting, and you need to apply Shor's lemma, and you find the dimension of this is not so coincidentally, the sum over all the representations of Ti times Ki times Ci. That's exactly the co-dimension formula that I claimed. So this is true from a calculation using Schur's lemma. So that's the, that's the explanation for the co-dimension formula. I still have to just prove that that linearization really is surjective. That's unfortunately the hard part, of course. So I claim that it's true. The derivative d phi at j naught u naught as a linear map from the tangent space to this universal moduli space of multiple covers to the finite dimensional vector space of g equivariant homomorphisms from kernel du naught n to its co-kernel is surjective. So if I can prove that, then the implicit function theorem will imply that we're done. So why is this true? So if you want to understand how phi varies when you move j and u around in the moduli space, um, 
there's a part of that question that's hopeless, which is if you, if you start moving the map u, you will get some formula that you never understand. But if you move j without moving u, that's something you can also do. You can move through the space of almost complex structures such that you're keeping it fixed right along the image of u, of u naught. If you do that, now you have to understand exactly how the cauchy riemann operator changes under such a change. But that's not such a hard calculation. So I'll write down the answer. Varying j so that it's fixed along u naught, meaning u naught stays j holomorphic, and therefore we're staying within this universal moduli space. We can perturb the normal operator of u naught by any g invariant zeroth order term. So in other words, take an element y that's in the tangent space at j naught to this space of almost complex structures. This is going to realize some perturbation of the normal operator of u naught by some extra zeroth order term, which I'll denote by a sub y. So a sub y is, in fact, a bundle map from the normal bundle of u to the bundle of anti-linear maps from t sigma prime to the normal bundle of u. Right? That's what I mean by zeroth order. It's tensorial. No derivatives. All right, so that means I can now write down a formula. You have to also look at some point at the definition of this map phi that I had in the general discussion, this d minus c a inverse b. So that's something that's also not too hard to differentiate. Actually, this is a, it's basically a polynomial function of a bunch of linear operators. So if I just want to write down now the partial derivative of this map phi with respect to the first variable, that's going to be a linear map that takes my tangent vector to the space of almost complex structures to some element in this finite dimensional space of g-equivariant homomorphisms. I'm going to call that Ly in hom g from kernel to co-kernel. And one can write down now a precise formula. It turns out to be that Ly acts on an element of the kernel, eta, by, first of all, acting on it with this zeroth order term. That sends it to some section of this bundle. And that's the target bundle of the cauchy riemann operator. So then you can project from there to the co-kernel in a natural way. So you take the projection of a y eta. This is the natural projection. Pi c from sections of this bundle of antilinear maps to the co-kernel. All right. Now, that's what the operator is. I want it to be Subjective, in other words, I want to be able to attain any given element of this space of G equivariant maps by choosing Y appropriately. Or, another, or I could just say by choosing the zeroth order term appropriately, because I know I can, I can choose Y to achieve any zeroth order term I want. So this thing here is what I have to choose. Now, one way to understand uh, these linear maps, and I can remove this projection from the picture by talking about matrix elements with respect to particular elements of the kernel and co-kernel. So let's put it this way. Let's abbreviate now. I'm just going to call D the normal operator that I'm interested in. It's acting on the bundle E, which is the normal bundle of U0, and so forth. I can also call F the target bundle. 
it's now sufficient to show that given any g invariant, sorry, g equivariant linear map psi from the kernel of D to the co-kernel of D, there exists a G invariant zeroth order term, in other words, a bundle map A from E to F, such that for all elements psi in the co-kernel and eta in the kernel, the matrix elements are the same. In other words, the L2 product of psi with a eta is the same as the L2 product of psi with psi eta. That's the problem I need to solve. I'm going to label it double star. And let me remark, intuitively this problem looks kind of solvable because there's a finite dimensional space of linear maps psi that I'm trying to achieve, that I'm trying to match, and I have an infinite dimensional space of zeroth order terms to move around in. Okay, so it looks like an underdetermined problem. There should be solutions. But why? So the next remark to make my life a little bit easier is that I can quickly forget about the g-action at this point. So, remark, if for a given psi, the problem star star has a solution A that is not G invariant. We can just symmetrize it. Because psi is already G equivariant, so when you symmetrize it, uh, you're just adding some near combination of other solutions to the same problem. You can always get one that will be symmetric, that will be G invariant. So I can now stop worrying about the G action altogether. That's no longer part of the problem. Symmetry is not my problem. Uh, the problem is rather just given such a linear map psi, can you find a zeroth order term so that this is satisfied for all eta and psi? So let's choose bases. psi i of the co-kernel and eta j of the kernel. Now, what would it mean if, uh, right, so I need to establish that, that relation for all combinations of those two sets of bases. What would it mean if it can't be done, if there's some psi you can't achieve? In other words, if the this is defining some map from the space of zeroth order terms into the space of linear maps from here to here. If it's not surjective, then there is some linear map here that's orthogonal to its image. What would that mean in practice? So if that problem is not always solvable, then having an element orthogonal to the image means there exists a set of numbers psi ij, not all of which are zero, such that the sum over all i and j, which are uh, indices for these two bases of kernel and co-kernel, of these numbers psi ij times psi a paired with a eta j in L2 will be zero for all zeroth order terms 
A. What does that mean? Let's rewrite this expression a little bit. I can rewrite this expression. Let's write out the L2 product as an integral and write this linear combination as rather uh, a linear, con so an element, a section of some tensor bundle with this bundle metric as a linear map defined on that tensor product. In other words, this is the same thing as integral over the domain sigma prime, I am almost done, of the bundle metric composed with identity tensor A, composed with the following section of a tensor product bundle, sum over all i and j of these coefficients psi i j, psi i of z tensor a to j of z. So when you look at it this way, I've got some section of a tensor bundle over here. I'm operating on it everywhere with some linear map. Now, as in our proof of, of transversality for simple curves, it's not hard to show that you can get a contradiction to a condition like this as soon as your section is somewhere non-vanishing. Right? In other words, this is going to be a contradiction unless this term here is identically zero. All right, so that leads you to kind of a unique continuation question, which was unfamiliar to me before I thought about this stuff. And I'll write down the relevant result. We know, of course, that each of the psi's and each of the eta's are not identically zero. In fact, they all satisfy their own continuation lemmas, which say that none of those can vanish to infinite order at any point. But you can also imagine that in this linear combination, there could be some horrible cancellation happening that does make the combination vanish in the tensor product. And as a matter of fact, unless you're careful and add an extra condition at this point, that really can happen, and you would be in trouble. So I'll write up here the so-called static unique continuation lemma. I'll just write it down, and then I'll stop. It's a local result. It says, for any Cauchy Riemann type operator D on a bundle E, mapping to sections of some bundle F, together with its full adjoint which I'll denote by D star that maps sections of F back to sections of E so the formal adjoint mainly has the property that its kernel is isomorphic to the co-kernel of D. That's the fact we want to use. And then take a pair of finite dimensional, totally real subspaces, K in the kernel of D and C in the kernel of D star. The statement is that the natural map from the real tensor product of those two spaces to the space of sections of the corresponding tensor product bundle, let's call this map I, defined by the obvious thing. Take I of a tensor product psi tensor eta will be a section of this tensor bundle. Its value at z is just psi of z tensor, eta of z. So the statement is that this map is injective. And sections in its image
cannot vanish to infinite order. At any point. All right, so you have I, I read this for to understand what it means. I'll tell you two things about it. I assumed that, that these two finite dimensional subspaces of the kernel and co-kernel are totally real, meaning any real basis of one of these spaces is also complex linearly independent. That's actually crucial. If you don't assume that, in particular, you can find examples where both operators are complex linear and the, the theorem simply isn't true. You can take non-trivial tensor products over here that turn out to be trivial sections of the tensor bundle over here. Okay, so in my paper on this stuff, I, I wrote down a, a counterexample. I couldn't tell you what it is off the top of my head. It took a while to come up with it. But it can happen. So you need this extra condition. Now, uh, just to give you an idea of the proof, there's an easy exercise for the special case where our Cauchy-Riemann operator is the ordinary d-bar operator on a trivial vector bundle, and then its formal adjoint will be minus the corresponding del operator. That means the objects in K are just holomorphic functions, and objects in C are anti-holomorphic functions. Now you can use Taylor series to prove it. The point, somehow, is that the sections eta in the kernel all have Taylor series of the form, well, what a Taylor series normally looks like. In particular, it's holomorphic, right? But for a not necessarily holomorphic function, a Taylor series is a power series in powers z as well as z bar. The anti-holomorphic ones only have powers of z bar. The reason this lemma is true is basically that when you put two things like that together in a tensor product, their powers of z and powers of z bar stay decoupled. So you end up not able to produce trivial linear combinations over here as long as those powers are staying decoupled. Some coefficient is going to be non-trivial. Okay. That's really the idea of why the lemma is true. My last remark. As I said, you really need this totally real condition, which means that in order to apply this, you need to assume generic, non-integrable, explicitly non-integrable perturbations of J. So that our normal operators have kernel and co-kernel always totally real. Right. So that can be done. It's, one can prove, actually, that for generic J, all holomorphic curves will have the property that the kernel and co-kernel of their Cauchy-Riemann operators are totally real. Uh, which means, in some sense, that J is as far as possible from being integrable. But that's a generic condition. It does mean that these theorems about regularity for multiple covers and superrigidity and so forth are distinctly symplectic phenomena. You can achieve them for generic J, but it's not surprising in some sense, but there's really no hope of achieving this for integrable J in general. And there are known counterexamples in the complex category as well. So I'll stop with that. Thank you for listening to me. So can you say a bit about what uh, Jack, these other examples come to the same but have some counter examples. Yeah, no, I can't really say what they are. There's I mean there's a particular paper. I think uh, it has the word rigidity in the title. I don't remember much else from about 2006. So yeah, there are known cases where the super rigidity condition is simply not true in some smooth algebraic varieties. So is it not in particular for the 
know, squinting threefold was at the super rigidity. Mm, off, off the top of my head, I don't remember. Just to uh, recapitulate, so this theorem is for any uh, symplectic manifold of dimension less than or equal to six, or uh, so uh, greater than or equal to six. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't actually know if it's true in dimension four, but I don't know if anyone cares either, so I haven't worried about it very much. Right, the interesting case is is really dimension six because that's where you always get uh, an obstruction bundle well defined as a consequence. Uh, it, the the condition is also true in higher dimensions but it doesn't mean much that's useful. It gives you some sort of obstruction bundle, but it has the wrong dimension to make computations. So the hypothesis, what, it's greater than or equal to six and semi-positive, or you don't even need to get I don't have to assume semi-positive. There's, there's no need for that. 